biosolutions not too long ago after not too long after my daughter was diagnosed because the people involved with the, this organization, including Jill's and Nicole Henwood, give me so much hope that better treatment options and even a cure will be found for NF2. I have the honor of introducing our incredible panel of experts today who are here to share their knowledge and time with us. We have Professor Shannon McDonald, who is an Associate Professor of Radiation Oncology at Harvard Medical School. She's an Associate Radiation Oncologist at Massachusetts General Hospital. Dr. McDonald is credentialed at Boston Children's Hospital and the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. She's a primary investigator for the Children's Oncology Group Study, ACNS 2021, which is also open for young adults through the Adult Cooperative Group. She's a specialist in proton therapy and is a pediatric radiation oncologist. And Dr. McDonald is the chief of base of skull and sarcoma radiation services at Mass General Hospital. I'd also like to introduce Professor Michelle Calamaridis, who's the head of the NF2 Center at the Hospital de la Pitié Salpetriere in Paris, France. Dr. Calamarides is a neurosurgeon at the Service of Neurosurgery, also at the Hospital de la Pitrie Salpetriere. He's a professor at Sorbonne University in Paris. And Dr. Calamarides is an adjunct professor of head and neck surgery and an adjunct professor of neurosurgery at UCLA. I'd also like to introduce Professor L. Dade Lunsford. Dr. Lunsford is a Lars Leskel Distinguished Professor. He's a neurosurgeon at the Department of Neurological Surgery and a professor of radiation oncology at the University of Pittsburgh. Dr. Lunsford is the director of the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center for Image Guided Neurosurgery. He's an associate resident director and chair at UPMC on the technology an innovative practice committee. So again, thank you to the three of you for being here today to share your knowledge and time with us. We're gonna start first with an introduction to some of the different kinds of radiotherapy. So Professor Lunsford and Professor McDonald are each gonna give us a brief introduction. And, and then after this introduction to different types of radiotherapy, we'll be getting into the panel discussion with questions for our, from our audience. So we'll go ahead and turn it over to you, Professor Lunsford. Thank you. We'll uh, see if we can get all the technology to work well. Can you see this slide? And yep. we go to full screen there. Yep, yes. you see full screen. Okay, great. Well, um, I'm gonna go through a few slides back uh, here um, just to maybe clarify some terminology and thank you for allowing me to participate in the uh, um, in this session. So uh, one of the things to first understand is uh, a difference in using wider field radiation therapy usually in multiple sessions versus using a very focused technique that can be efficiently delivered in a single procedure, a term that is called radiosurgery as opposed to radiation therapy. And the reason it's called this is because of its use for precision guiding devices to be able to facilitate treatment um, focused on individual tumors in a, in a single treatment. And this sort of upset an apple cart of about 75 years of knowledge when it was first proposed uh, because it changed the concepts of understanding how tissues respond uh, differently uh, compared to when uh, this is done in a single treatment versus in a uh, multi-session type of treatment. And really the term was first created almost 70 years ago by uh, Lars Luxell uh, working at the Karolinska Institute. Um, and to do this, the guiding device is used, which is the firm Stereotactic uh, comes from. It's three-dimensional uh, uh, um, way to be able to deliver the radiation. Uh, and across the world, there are a variety of techniques where this can be used. 
on certain modified linear accelerators, uh, on gamma knife, uh, cyber knife, uh, zap knife, all of these represent technologies from different manufacturers that allow this uh, type of treatment to be uh, done. Um, our work over the last 40 years has been related to the use of the gamma knife and worldwide there's huge experience with this with more than 10,000 publications related to its uh, outcomes. And as it ap applies to patients with NF2, this includes many patients with various cranial nerve schwannomas, especially uh, the eighth nerve, but also facial nerve, trigeminal nerve, and lower cranial nerves. Uh, meningiomas or growths on the lining surface of the brain, certain gliomas and certain ependymomas. M many of these cases are done after initial surgical um, uh, approach uh, are done. Um, and it's very convenient for patient. It sort of has a surgical bias based on the guiding device and is typically done in a wheels in to wheels out approach. So we started looking at this not only from its potential role in this difficult disorder, but not only its outcome role, but also what it does in terms of a preserving neurological function and cranial nerve function, as well as looking at risks. But typically the way this is done, uh, a patient with mild sedation has this guiding device applied to the head. We make a new MRI scan to define the target and we develop a plan which allows us to treat the tumor in a single treatment. There's no opening of the skull, there's no incisions. Um, it's paramount that the effectiveness is confined to the tumor with very sharp fall off of the delivery of the dose outside of the uh, target. And more recently, this device has been updated to, in certain cases, allow this to be done with a more uh, uh, mask type of mobilization, which works in certain patients, especially in uh, uh, patients who are um, not claustrophobic or patients who are uh, somewhat older. And typically the goal of this is to inactivate growth of the tumor and monitor the cranial nerve function afterwards and to see uh, hopefully over the course of time, gradual regression or shrinkage of the tumor and a low risk of uh, side effects. We recently completed a study uh, of, um, through a multi-center uh, consortium that uh, we organized here in Pittsburgh. There are now 32 uh, centers that participate in this. And we looked at a uh, 267 NF2 patients uh, 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 in this group, but uh, there were 328 uh, tumors. So uh, many of these were bilateral or uh, both sided tumors. Uh, these patients were typically in the younger age group. Uh, um, and the goal of this is to give in a single dose at the margin of this tumor, a minimum dose of 12 uh, gray. And what we found over time is that tumors uh, can be arrested in terms of growth uh, in 77% when we look at outcomes at uh, 10 years. But 11% of the patients required repeat procedures, usually for new tumor development or delayed, late, delayed uh, tumor progression of a, of a, uh, of a tumor. Um, and what we found out is, is that uh, in general, younger patients uh, and those with uh, one-sided tumors do better and that sometimes uh, respond better to a little bit higher dose uh, dividend than a single treatment. But the other goal of this is to look at how the patient's uh, outcomes uh, um, are maintained. And when we looked at patients, especially with these hearing uh, tumors, uh, um, that at five years, uh, we can maintain serviceable hearing in uh, almost two thirds, but 10 years that uh, hearing preservation rate has dropped to about one out of three. Um, and for those patients, because the facial nerve is very uh, close to these tumors, the goal was to preserve function of the facial nerve, which can be done in the vast majority of patients uh, uh, with grade one or grade two uh, function um, on long-term outcomes. But one of the concerns with the delivery of radiation has always been what is the subsequent risk of other tumor development or what is the risk of conversion of a tumor which is histologically benign to a tumor that is more aggressive or, or malignant. And there have been sporadic cases that have been reported to, um, along with this uh, often in the, in the literature, but this Sometimes this is, gets carried through uh, uh, social media um, as, uh, as a definitive uh, answer. 
At present, we find no convincing evidence for increased risk after single fraction radius surgery, which goes along with an article that we published in Lancet Oncology a few years ago, uh, which is simply the, the risk is similar to the risk of a general population who have, uh, have a primary CNS tumor but do not have NF2. In this uh, long-term follow-up that we looked at, uh, um, where 75% of the patients had uh, freedom from any additional treatment by 15 years, um, radiation-related tumor development or radiation-related malignant transformation of a treated tumor were not seen. Um, we would just like to add that in addition to those tumors, uh, of course, the, um, of cranial nerves, uh, tumors involve or meningiomas involving uh, structures uh, um, of the brain, which is very common part of NF2, uh, can also be treated effectively by this uh, same type of technique with very high uh, nerve preservation rates in terms of vision and feeling of the face. So just to summarize our philosophy related to this, we understand uh, as do patients and families over time that this is a very complex genetic uh, uh, disorder, the impact varies with individual patients. And the decision making as to what to do in terms of management or when to do something has to be balanced very carefully between the overall risk and benefit. So when tumors uh, are symptomatic and shown to grow over time by imaging, both surgery and radiation options need to be considered. And we must balance that with the outcomes uh, of this in, in the patient's uh, life. And the goal is also preservation of neurological function. It may need over the course of time to be repeated because of the risk that these tumors will grow um, or new meningiomas will develop over time. And each time that problem presents clinically, it must, must again be reassessed as to which option might be the best with uh, the, those patients. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lunsford. Okay, next we'll hear from Professor McDonald. And if you would like to share a little bit of background on proton beam therapy, um, we'd like to hear a little bit about that next. Great, can you hear me okay and see my slides? Yes. Great, so thanks for the opportunity to speak with you today. I'm gonna to go over some basics of radiation therapy with a focus on proton therapy and some examples and comparison of proton radiation versus more standard X-ray or photon radiation. And um, because I know we have a lot of families and parents and non healthcare workers in the audience, I thought I would go over some basics of radiation therapy to start, um, how it works and how we can better deliver radiation, basics of some types of photon radiation treatments that many of you have heard of, and then basics of proton beam therapy. So as a background, um, radiation therapy is not familiar to many people who are not radiation oncologists or radiologists, and there are many different forms of radiation. The types of radiation that we'll speak about today include x-rays, gamma rays, and also proton therapy. And these are types of radiation that can be beneficial to humans by treating tumors, um, but can also be harmful to normal healthy tissues. So when we're delivering radiation therapy therapeutically, we're always trying to give the highest dose we can and the therapeutic dose needed to the tumor, but minimize any radiation therapy to healthy tissues that are not involved with the tumor. And photons are x-rays. They need to enter and exit the body. Similar to that, Gamma knife is a form of X-ray therapy or photon therapy, similar to photon therapy that's produced by a linear accelerator or machine. Gamma knife is produced by a source that decays and creates photons. And photons or protons work by damaging DNA in cells. And cancer cells are more susceptible than normal healthy tissue or normal organs are to radiation therapy, but it is a form of therapy that damages the DNA in cells, again, more so tumor cells than healthy tissues, and therefore causes them to die or lose the ability to replicate. And because of the properties of healthy tissue versus tumor, 
most radiation sessions are given over a fractionated course where there are many treatments over several weeks, usually about five or six weeks, but some radiation sessions are delivered in one treatment, something called stereotactic radiosurgery, gamma knife treatments. And this is because of the ability to focus very high dose in a small, small area while minimizing any high dose to the surrounding areas. For radiation therapy, often we'll have an immobilization device that keeps patients in the same position every day. Sometimes this is in the form of a mold that is soft when you lie down on it, but forms to the body. And sometimes it's in the form of a mask. And then we were just shown some very rigid masks, but this is a softer mask, which is a mesh-like material that goes on in a soft mesh way and then hardens to the shape of the face and clips into a board behind. There are many terms for different types of radiation therapy. The commonly used types of radiation therapy today include conformal radiation therapy, which is delivered with a machine called an accelerator, intensity modulated radiation therapy, which is delivered with a linear accelerator, but in a more sophisticated way. Another term you might hear is something called VMAT, which is volumetric arc therapy. And then there's stereotactic radiosurgery or stereotactic radiotherapy, um, which are delivered usually in a more rigid frame and a smaller number of treatments, sometimes one, sometimes a few treatments. And then there's proton radiation, which differs in properties by being a particle that enters the body and stops. So unlike x-rays, proton therapy does not, does not have to go through the body and continue to go through, but will stop. For radiation planning, um, whatever part of the body we're treating, we typically use a CAT scan and an MRI, and we have machines that can do planning with both. And we also work with our radiologists to bring in any images that have been obtained, and that might be an, MR, an MRI, a CT, a PET scan, um, any type of imaging can be brought in and fused to whatever planning scan you get in the treatment position. Tumors are delineated based on MRI and CT, and often giving a margin of, for safety and setup error, which is seen in green here, the red is an example of a volume for an acoustic component. Linear accelerators, again, are machines that deliver photon radiation, which is produced elect elect with electricity, and you take electrons, bang them into a target, and, and the pre creating photons that can come out of this machine. There are blocks in the machine that block the healthy tissue from seeing radiation and the radiation comes through in this open area. A lot of patients ask, you know, do I need to wear a lead apron? Do I need to wear something on my body? But the blocks are much thicker than anything you could ever put on the body and are in the head of the machine. IMRT treats with tiny little microbeams and is a very sophisticated type of photon therapy. Um, and VMAT is very similar to this. And then stereotactic treatments are typically delivered with many, many tiny beams, which end up delivering a very low dose outside of the target area, but a high dose to the target area. And the different types of therapy include gamma knife, enac based stereotactic radiosurgery, and cyber. This is an example of a gamma knife machine, one of the most stable types of treatment because of this very secure helmet. And this is a machine that has 201 cobalt sources that deliver a very high dose to a small target and a very low dose anywhere outside of that target. And this is generally done in one day. This is a rigid frame um, with a bite block that is used for stereotactic radio surgery delivered with a lima, which is similarly delivers very small tiny beams to a tumor and spreads out with only very low dose to areas that are not being treated. Photon beam therapy is special in that it is not a, a form of photon therapy. It is a totally different type of treatment and it is a, a, a particle therapy. 
The other type of particle therapy that you may hear about is called carbon ion therapy, not currently available in the US, but likely to be available in the US in 2027, and something that is still being investigated. But proton beam therapy is a much more common form of particle therapy. Um, in the past, when I started at MDH, there were only three machines in the US. Um, and that was in 2006, there are now about 40. And so it's becoming a more widely available form of therapy. And protons in a pristine proton beam enter in at a very low dose, can treat and at any depth up to 32 centimeters. And you determine how deep you want the beam to go by determining the energy of the beam and how fast it will travel in. And then it delivers its dose over a very small area and delivers no dose after it treats the area needed. So the major benefits come from no exit dose, but there are also benefits for some treatments for less entrance dose as well. Again, there's been a huge growth since, um, since the early years of proton therapy with about 40 proton centers in the US and many, under, many more under construction. And this is an example of our proton unit. We have a cyclotron, which is which accelerates protons to about two thirds the speed of light. They are then fed out through a beam line, which is a series of very powerful magnets and degraders. The cyclotron is one form of machine that produces Protons. The other form is a synchrotron. A cyclotron always produces the highest energy photons, and you degrade it when you do not need to use the highest energy and have a more superficial target. We have three treatment rooms, and then we have a second synchrotron machine in a different area of our hospital. So a total of four rooms for proton therapy. The protons are created or pulled off of water essentially and accelerated in a cyclotron. This shows you the beam line. They are then delivered to one room at a time. This is a gantry room, which is the most commonly used room. We have two gantry rooms and a fixed beam. The fixed beam can be used to treat very small targets in the sitting position or moving the patient around the beam. The gantry, despite just the job of moving the beam around the patient, is a three-story um, unit, which is a very large um, machine compared to a linear accelerator and weighs about 100 tons. So this is a, a massive piece of the machine, despite the fact that it's really just made to move protons around a patient. The fixed room has a simple, very small, sharp beam and is often used to treat eye tumors, sometimes small brain tumors. And this again is just an example of the cyclotron and the gantry and the beam. So for proton therapy, in the past, we had to select very carefully the patients that we were treating. We still do select tumors that are likely to be, uh, that be more amenable to proton therapy and the benefits. So we select patients with curable tumors, often very young patients, and young adult patients and patients with NF typically have very curable tumors and we're aiming to reduce side effects. So a very common population to be treated with protons should you need to use radiation therapy. Survival for children and patients with tumors that are associated with NF is often excellent and our aim is to decrease late effects for these patients. So for the tumors that we're treating for NF patients, we're usually not trying to improve the cure rate, but we're trying to decrease the weight effects. Here I'm showing an example of a retinoblastoma, which is not a tumor associated with NF, but I wanted to show this slide because it shows that for, with proton therapy, and I show a very old plan from 1985, um, and there have been a series of more modern proton plans in the interim, and then I show a proton plan that's from 2012. You can see the reduction in the excess dose of radiation. There are many benefits in terms of side effects for, for these children. And these are patients that have a very, very high risk of forming a second malignancy. So it was an ideal population to look at 10-year outcomes 
and see a difference um, in the rate of second malignancies, which we did for proton therapy, where we saw zero radiation-induced tumors, but with proton therapy, the rate was 14%. And this was a study that MGH did in conjunction with Boston Children's Hospital for this rare tumor, but in a, in a population that is prone to second malignancies and forming them early to show that there's a benefit to decreasing second malignancies because of the decreased tissue exposure to protons. This is an example of a spinal treatment. If photon dose continues to exit the body with protons, you get complete sparing of any tissue in front of the target. So here, the bone is being included, but if you're including only the spinal canal, you would have sparing of the vertebral body and there is sparing of the esophagus, heart, lungs, ovaries, um, GI system. So this is a major area of benefit. So spinal appendomomas and PMSTs are tumors that can be treated. This is an example of treatment of the brain appendomoma. And this is just showing the evolution from proton to proton. And then finally, refinements with something called PBS or IMPT, which is available in almost all proton centers today. So many excellent photon and proton radiation techniques exist for the treatment of these tumors and, um, and for the tumors associated with them. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Professor McDonald. Okay, next we will go ahead and just start going through questions that our audience has submitted. So we're gonna do a panel discussion now with the three of you. Our audience can continue to type questions in the question section of the meeting as well. So we're gonna talk about applications, protocol and limitations of radiotherapy to start. And I'll direct this one to you, Dr. Lunsford. I know you've addressed some of these in your slides already, but what is the strategy for radiosurgical treatment of bilateral vestibular schwannomas? Um, first of all, we do not treat two tumors at the same time um, with uh, radiosurgery. And in general, the decision-making relative to uh, tumor selection and patient selection comes down to um, size of the tumor, uh, progression of the tumor over the course of time, usually by imaging uh, studies done over multiple months or years. And finally, the overall status of the patient's uh, um, hearing. So the goal really is to inactivate or prevent further growth of a tumor which is known to be growing. Uh, there is no absolute a way to predict which tumor in NF2 will grow when or how fast. So as a general rule, we're going to select patients who have uh, symptomatic progression. That is a tumor that has been growing over the course of uh, imaging, which may be months or years, and who is getting new neurologic problems, uh, specifically uh, hearing. Okay, and for you, Professor Calamarides, and your experience with patients in the clinic, when are you recommending or not recommending radiation for vestibular schwannomas? Thank you. Yes, we have a gamma knife in uh, our department, and we have a proton uh, uh, facility in, uh, in France. Um, I think that uh, what said the Professor Linsford is very clear. So we recommend uh, radiosurgery uh, when uh, we observe tumor growth over the years. I don't know, I'm not in favor of proactive treatment as it some, sometimes perform in some centers. And this is a big question about uh, the timing of gamma knife or surgery. It's for me, gamma knife or surgery, it's exactly the same. It's different in terms of maybe uh, time or and recovery, but it's exactly the same discussion. But I think that I'm managing the reference center for NF2. I think that we have to offer all the options. So for me, when I see an NF2 patient with a bilateral vestibular schwannoma that are growing similarly, I think that a focal treatment is not a good option. So I would recommend this patient other options that bevacizumab, everolimus, or other treatment. So I think that in case of bilateral growth, it's very difficult. 
what I understood from the presentation from Prof. Dead Lunsford is that, in fact, it seems that the gamma knife is working better for the smallest tumor, which is normal, and in the older patient, right? So I think that we use gamma knife mostly for older NF2 patient with uh, small growing uh, vestibular schwannoma. In very young patients, we don't use uh, frequently the gamma knife. The radiotherapists don't want to use a gamma knife. They prefer to use a proton beam therapy. And just to finish, there is maybe a risk of malignancy in young NF2 patients. We'll discuss this later. So I think that for bilateral, in case of bilateral growth, I prefer to use uh, systemic treatment. Thank you. Um, Dr. Lunsford, maybe you can address this question. What is the latest data on the impact of radiation on vestibular schwannoma on, on the impact on hearing, facial nerve function, and balance? So I presented a little bit of this in my uh, in my talk. Um, what we have seen uh, is tumor control long term can be achieved in uh, about seventy five percent. That is three quarters of patients. Uh, we can preserve hearing uh, early in the um, uh, post treatment phase, very high level, um, in uh, probably seventy five percent of patients. But by the time ten years pass then only about one third of the patients have hearing at a level which can be say, for example, used on a cell phone uh, to communicate uh, with that ear. Um, the natural history of these tumors is uh, over time to grow, but the rate at which they grow um, uh, is one of the issues that we try to uh, look at very carefully. Um, but once a patient has evidence of growth and hearing getting worse, in my view, that's the time to consider radiosurgery because we can save hearing when the tumors are smaller. We can save hearing when the hearing is already at a high level, much better than we can save hearing um, in a patient whose hearing has already begun to deteriorate significantly. And certainly treatment does not restore hearing. Um, so treatment can't bring hearing that's already um, deteriorated back. It, that doesn't happen. So um, as you know, there are also uh, options for surgical removal of these tumors. And sometimes partial surgical removal uh, can be considered. Um, and then in certain patients, if hearing is still preserved at that point, we might add the radiosurgery after partial resection of the tumor. I will say that I think there's one tumor which I think very clearly should be treated primarily by radiosurgery, and that is NF2 patients with facial nerve sheath tumors, because those patients have the best chance of facial nerve function preservation um, as opposed to surgical removal of those, uh, of those tumors. So uh, we prefer to use uh, uh, gamma knife early in, in that in that group of patients to have the best chance of long-term facial nerve function. That includes the patients who have who have uh, vestibular or acoustic neuromas um, because the, the risk of treatment of, of causing a facial nerve sheath uh, weakness um, or, or weakness of the face is uh, much less in patients whose tumors are smaller who are treated sooner. Okay, and for Dr. McDonald, is radiation used for meningiomas? And what about optical nerve meningiomas? Oh, yes, radiation can be used for that indication. And, um, and that's actually, I think, a great indication for proton radiation um, because of better sparing of the pituitary gland, the adjacent brain, and also bony areas if the child, if it's a child and they're growing. Um, it can preserve vision if there is still vision remaining. At, because the doses that we need to use are tolerated by the optic nerve and it can decrease the dose to the retina, which can often be high enough to cause some visual loss. So I think it's um, a great indication for selected patients and proton radiation would be a nice indication for that. Okay, 
And a question for all three of you or any of you, is radiation used for spinal ependymomas? Yes. Uh, I'll, I'll start. Yes, the answer is yes. Um, for symptomatic uh, tumors that are growing, um, yes, uh, radiation typically done in fractionated technique is used, but there are forms of spinal radiosurgery that can be considered in certain patients uh, as well, so that the number of sessions is reduced compared to the more standard fractionation um, for these uh, for these types of tumors. Uh just a point, I think that there is no place for radiotherapy for spinal ependymoma in an FT patient, uh, because uh, I think that most of symptomatic ependymoma are cystic, and I don't think that uh, radiation is a good option for this very low uh, growing ependymoma. Also, um, it's, uh, I don't, I've, I've never seen any publication on an F2, any experience. Uh, on ependymoma, spinal ependymoma. Do you know any uh, series of patients treated by radiotherapy or proton therapy for spinal ependymoma? I don't think there are. Okay. I think that observation, surgery, bevacizumab for the cystic part, when the cystic part is very large, or surgery, but radiotherapy, I'm not sure it's a uh, what do you do for a recurrent tumor after initial surgery? Uh, in fact, it's very strange because we observe, in fact, it's like for meningioma, it's rare. The, the rate of recurrence after surgery is lower than for sporadic. It's the same for uh, NF2-related ependymoma. So it's very, uh, it's a rare uh, option to do a recurrent surgery. So recurrent radiotherapy, you know, radiotherapy or surgery, it's exactly for me the same. It's an indication of tumor growth. So it's rare to see recurrence right. practically. I have just a question for you, Lansford. It's for what is your impression about the results? I, I know the response, but just for the patient, the, re, the results of uh, radiosurgery for NF2 uh, vesicular schonema compared to sporadic, because for surgery, it's sometimes more difficult to remove uh, vesicular schonema in an F2 patient because it's multinodular. Maybe sometimes it, they are collision tumor. So uh, the results for surgery are not so good for that for sporadic. I think it's the same uh, for uh, the NF2 patient. What is your experience? I agree completely, yes. If we compare patients with sporadic unilateral vestibular schwannomas, um, hearing preservation rates, facial nerve preservation rates are, are uh, much higher, especially because these are being diagnosed sooner now, um, uh, and tumors are often smaller than they used to be in prior years when they were diagnosed. So, it's only a question of volume. You don't think it's something more based on, you know, the multinodular because we know that there are multiple tumors, in fact, in NF2, looking like, like, like one only big tumor, but, or small, but it's multinodular. So maybe I think it's may, maybe more based on biology, on you know, anatomy, or maybe more well, than I, the size. I, yeah, certainly, I agree. I mean, unilateral tumors can displace cranial nerves. NF2-related schwannomas engulf or swallow the nerves in which case either surgical or radiosurgical options have much higher risk uh, um, of those nerves uh, getting worse afterwards. And we know that in young NF2 patients with fast growing uh, vestibular schonoma, you know, uh, medical treatment are not working. And I know that surgery sometimes has to be done and it's the same for radiosurgery. It's, very, it's the most difficult case is to be treated. Young NF2 patient with fast growing Schwannoma when they are uh, from the beginning medium sized or large. I think it's the same in, for surgery and radio surgery, I think. It's the most difficult cases. I agree. As in younger patients. Okay, thank you. We're going to ask for a little audience participation now, and we'll have Jill's launch a poll. So go ahead, Jill's, please launch that. And audience, you can answer the question that you see on your screen.
what type of operations or treatments have you done? And you can check mark multiple answers. Second question there, do you have a planned intervention in the near future? Okay, and as a panelist, I cannot see those results. Can you see those, Jills? Uh, uh, yes, I think when I end the poll, it will be displayed. Let's see. Okay. But, but let's give another five seconds for people to answer. I, can, I still see some okay. answer coming in. Okay, so let's finish with this poll. Okay, share results. Here are the results. Okay, thank you to our audience for participating in that poll. We're gonna move on to a few more questions about combining radiotherapy with other types of therapy. So for uh, Dr. Calamarides, we used to believe that radiation made subsequent traditional surgery more difficult. Is that still the case? I'm not sure it's the case, uh, especially after gamma knife, I'm doing some surgery for vestibular schwannoma in uh, sporadic. I don't feel it's so different. The question is when you decide to do surgery and when there is a case of failure of gamma knife, which is rare, you deal with a large tumor, but technically it's not different. I don't know the experience of uh, Ned Lunsford. He has a, I, right. I, I think there's a, a fair amount of disinformation out there that patients have received that uh, surgical removal after radiation or radiation therapy has become more difficult. I think in some cases it may be even uh, less difficult because one of the effects is to uh, uh, change blood vessel supply of these, uh, of these uh, tumors. But in terms of- yeah. Excuse me, it's more difficult. I, I had some difficulty after uh, classical radiotherapy you know, uh, 55 grays. So when you have to do surgery, it can be more difficult, but after gamma knife, no. There is honestly no difference. That's our experience as well. Okay, and another question. What about the combination of radiation and Avastin or other drugs? Is Avastin needed or useful to reduce inflammation triggered by the radiation? Oh. I can start with one answer. I mean, we use Avastin frequently when we detect um, reaction or edema that is swelling around the tumor, which does not necessarily respond to a short course of cortisone anti-inflammatory agents or steroids. We then move to uh, using Avastin in those patients I don't think it changes the response necessarily of the tumor or improves uh, tumor control, but it's very effective in dealing with the uh, radiation related complications of, uh, of uh, tumors. They're the same. We also use it after swelling due to radiation. Okay, and I'll start with you on this one, Professor McDonald. What medical centers have performed the most procedures with each type of radiation on patients with NF2? Okay, so I'd say that's um, a difficult one to answer. I think for proton radiation, we've had protons in some form since the 1960s. So we have a lot of experience with protons, but we don't have a gamma knife unit. And the there are several gamma knife units in the US um, and, and abroad, so I can't answer for the world, but that's another very commonly used modality. And then um, the NAC based stereotype of radiation is very widely available as well. I think as a general concept uh, for patients and families, 
if you can find centers that have a team approach uh, with uh, people who are involved in all the modalities that includes uh, a neuro-oncologist who may be involved in using uh, uh, the system matter with Aston, radiation oncologists, neurosurgeons, um, uh, so that all the options can be properly evaluated in individual patients, including the timing and the various roles. Um, and one of the ways that patients can look at that, um, trying to define a center of excellence, is mm -hmm. what is the track record of that center for uh, publication related to that disorder? And um, are they involved in clinical studies and clinical trials trying to fine tune or improve outcomes uh, for these difficult uh, problems? Um, and the, those centers that certainly have the higher case volume, uh, regardless of what strategy is used, uh, those centers that have the uh, um, highest case volumes, publication rates, uh, things like that are one way to help sort out um, what is a center of excellence. I just would add, yes, you are totally right. I just would add, uh, it's important to participate to NF2 meeting. To it's it's a small world, but you know I think that people participating to our, we have uh, a meeting every four years NF2 state of the art, so where we discuss only on NF2, and such attendance shows that uh, people are very involved in NF2, which is a small field, but it's important to to be there. So I would add this because in the paper sometimes especially for radio surgery, you have multiple uh, team like the, the two, 12 gamma knife center involved. So it's difficult sometimes to, to know exactly, you know, the number of cases by uh, centers. So you are very famous for gamma knife, but sometimes it's difficult to know exactly the number of patients. Yes, I agree. Very good. Okay, I'd like to give each of our panelists a few minutes, if you'd like, for some final thoughts and conclusions. And then we'll also have Jill's go through some of the questions and answers that were submitted during this presentation. So we'll give you each a few minutes and Jill's can read a few final questions that have come up during the presentation. We'll start with you, Dr. Calamarides. Yes, I think that the most important is to consider that NF2 uh, patients should be managed uh, holistically. So not only vestibular schwannoma, but they have to be followed. You need to know the natural history of every tumor before deciding to treat a tumor. Patients should be aware about all the possibilities of treatment, surgery, radiosurgery, and it's better to, to see the professional, not to discuss gamma knife with a surgeon who has no experience in uh, radiosurgery, and the same discussion with a surgeon who has experience not only with a radiosurgeon. I just want to add something on malignancy. We didn't discuss, I saw your presentation. We were recently at the European NF meeting where Garrett Evans, a geneticist very famous for NF2, showed uh, his experience in UK where they can collect all the NF2 patients because they are very well organized in four centers. And they show the experience of 30 years of follow-up. And they show that in their experience, uh, maybe you can, can, can I share my the screen? Yeah, there's yes. a shared screen button. Okay. Yeah. So you see my screen? Yes. So I have the, 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 the slides that Garrett Evans gave me because it was interesting. So they analyze uh, 266 patients irradiated by all the possibility, not only gamma knife, but proton, and their results, I want to go directly. Uh, they, find, they, they observe that 7.5% uh, uh, of patients treated by radiation, whatever the type of radiation, and over the last 40 years, so it's not recently, developed malignancy progression compared to only 2% of patients uh, after uh, uh, the age of uh, 26. And this is the conclusion. They observe that radiotherapy is associated with 5% rate of malignancy. 
and the, there is no uh, VS MPNST re reported without radiotherapy. So it's where, but it does exist, like you know, death after surgery. But in their experience, and uh, there is an increased risk, not so high, but there is a risk of malignancy, especially for after radiotherapy, radiosurgery, proton beam therapy in young, the youngest NF2 patients. So I think that that should be discussed. It's not, you know, like I say, it's not a no-go, like for, you know, surgery after gamma life, but it's, I think, an interesting experience because they collect all the cases in one island, I would say. So they try to publish the paper. It's difficult because it's controversy, but I wanted to add this to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. McDonald, do you have any last thoughts or conclusions that you'd like to share with the audience? Sure, so I'll just say, um, you know, thank you to professors Callum Edwards and Lunsford, and I would agree with many of the things that you stated as well. And I reiterate that it is very important for any patient with NF2 to go to a center of excellence to have multidisciplinary tumor boards and make sure you have physicians that reach out to others with expertise in NF2 and in the field. And include them in the discussion. It's always great to get more than one opinion and you should never feel um, badly about getting a second opinion. But these are very rare cases and there are often multiple options. Um, I do worry most about second malignancies, which is why I showed a slide on that, because a lot of patients with NF2 have very curable tumors and they will live for a long time after the treatment of their tumors. And just like pediatric patients, even if you are older than 23, I would still worry about a malignancy that could be induced by radiation 30 or 40, 50 years later. Um, our, our outcomes often don't track patients for that long, even in the best clinical studies. So um, we use radiation sparingly when we can preserve a function and when there are not other options, but, um, but not, um, not routinely. Uh, for patients with NF2, we look for other options typically first. And, um, and we also, again, recommend modalities like particle therapy or proton therapy um, that minimize the dose to tissues that do not need to be treated in hopes of reducing that risk of evolution. So thank you again for the opportunity. Thank you, Professor McDonald. And Professor Lunsford, do you have any final words or thoughts for the audience? Well, uh, um, yes, in the sense that uh, I think the individualized treatment for each patient is, uh, is uh, critical. Um, and there are, is no one magic bullet that is the right treatment for every patient. Um, and finally, uh, I would say, while you're gathering information, try to gather it from centers that are working on this disease uh, with scientific and academic publications. Please do not rely on social media or the internet to uh, try to grasp what represents the latest and greatest treatment for this complex uh, disorder. Um, it, it is a field which stirs emotion even in not only patients and families, it stirs it among doctors as well. And some doctors tend to have rather rigid beliefs uh, about uh, their, their certain strategy for management of this. If I found a patient doctor who, uh, a doctor who had such rigid beliefs, I would very gracefully leave and find another doctor. Thank you. Okay. Great, thank you. All right, um, we'll turn it over to Jill's now to look through or read through some final questions that the audience had typed in during this presentation. Yes, so the, there's many, many questions, so we won't be able to take all of them, but I promise that I will, I'm going to share all the questions with the panelists and uh, hopefully um, the panelists will be able to answer to them later on. And I have your email, I know, uh, have the email of the people that are submitting questions, so you will be able to get the answer. So let's start with a few questions. So is there a question from Elena Roll? 
uh, Elena Roll, she's from France and she has a, a young child with NF2. Uh, is there a minimum size of tumor for proton therapy and a minimal age of, for the patients for using proton therapy? So for age, there's no minimum age, but the younger the patient, the more we try to avoid radiation in general. But if you are using radiation, the younger the age, the more likely we are to recommend proton radiation. If you have a tumor that is very, very small, like a small vestibular schwannoma, it may be that a treatment like gamma knife or stereotactic radio surgery is actually better than proton radiation because tiny, tiny tumors um, are difficult to treat with protons. Uh, if they are less than you know, a, a, a centimeter and a half, so that would be might be a better treatment with gamma for less. Could could you define what is small? That's another question. So what is a small tumor? So What's the size? A size of about a centimeter to a centimeter and a half or smaller. Okay, thank you. Another question from CJ Etel: uh, Are these type of treatments available to patients who have cochlear and ABI placement with magnets? Can, uh, uh, yeah. I'll make one answer. The answer is that for many techniques where imaging is absolutely critical to define the target, these devices uh, have a huge artifact um, and some of them will require removal of the battery uh, or the device to be able to follow the patient uh, clinically. Um, so I think there it has to be a very delicate balance between the benefit of these devices versus the uh, likelihood that uh, brain imaging will be seriously difficult um, to uh, follow the growth of, uh, of such a, or response of such tumors over time. Just, yes, we have patient with uh cochlear implant or ABI, and it's possible to do gamma knife. We have uh, many cases like this. Uh, sometimes uh, the uh, subcutaneous magnet has to be removed just during the procedure of the gamma knife, but it's, it's quite possible. Thank you. Is it post question from Nicole and Owen Wood. Is it possible to treat only part of the tumor away from the nerve to control bulk, but improve with the goal to improve the hearing preservation. So is it possible to treat only part of the tumor away from- Where the are the nerves? It's difficult to, to see the nerve on the MRI. So now it's a, it's a difficulty, I think. Even, even with very small tumors, uh, we can not always see the nerve as it uh, courses along or sometimes within the tumor. Um, and uh, I think subtotal treatment has to be better defined, but um, uh, lower dose in some uh, centers has been used to try to have better hearing preservation rates. But in our experience, uh, it has uh, much less effectiveness as well in terms of tumor, uh, tumor control. Thank you. Question like from, uh, is, sorry. I was say it is sometimes possible to spare the cochlea, which is also result in hearing loss for patients who have intact hearing at the time of radiation, but that you wouldn't treat part of the tumor in order to do that typically. I agree. Questions from Roland Toms. With spinal empedemomas, will this type of radiation cause the tumor to swell, to increase in size after treatment? So it could, it depends on you know, if the tumor is pressing on the spinal cord, how large it is, if that would be symptomatic or not. Um, we do treat ependymomas frequently in patients without NF2. And generally we try to surgically decompress or remove as much as possible to avoid that complication. Yeah, Professor Lunsford answers it. Okay, another question about proton beam from Barbara Franklin. Can the proton beam save the sight, save the vision if you have a for example, a, a, a tumor on the optical nerve. It, yes, in certain situations, it can help to preserve sight. So an indication for proton radiation would be a patient with an optic nerve and a geoma and intact vision um, in order to preserve function. So again, there are risks of radiation, but there's all, there are also benefits um, in terms of the treatment of that type of tumor that may be the only vision sparing option available. 
Thank you, thank you very much. I think we are over time now, Mary. And as I say, I promise to go over the questions and submit them to our panelists so we can get their answer uh, in the next few days. Very good. Thank you to all of our panelists for sharing your expertise. I learned so much listening to you and I'm sure our audience did as well. So thank you for your time and your expertise today. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Yep.